Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. We're going to start right on the dot here. Um, hope you're all doing well. Uh, hope you've all enjoyed the snowstorm. Not really usual for Pittsburgh to get that much, but it's kind of fun when it does. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I guess, I mean, today we're going to kind of keep forging ahead. Okay, so I basically finished up Malthus last time. All right, and, uh, you know, I guess you guys are working on the homework, checking that out. All right, uh, the um, homework is due two days, right? Yeah, two days from now um, on Thursday, right? Uh, I, I have it due at, at class time. Um, I don't know, when did, when did Danny have his homeworks due? Nine AM. Okay. Um yeah, I don't know, like uh Yeah, I mean the only thing I was thinking is like if I did it like Friday night, then you could talk to Misha for a station. Um or you could hand them in to Misha, I guess that would also make sense. Um so we we could do um well it won't matter this week because it's online anyway. Uh but we could do hand them in at recitation, so um, I don't know. Do you guys have any preferences there? Or are you kind of okay with anything? It was restation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We could do that. I mean, that that's probably, well, that's easier because Mish is going to be on the grading them. So it might just be easier to have them do a recitation. So, uh, yeah, let's do that. If you want to finish it by two thirty the day before, you can. Uh, but uh, let's let's do let's do rest station. So I'll yeah I'll change that um, on campus. Okay, so just for consistency, let's do it at eleven a.m. on Friday. Okay, um, so I think that should work. All right, cool. Uh, okay, so so I guess um, we're gonna. First caffeinate. Then we're gonna uh, talk about solo. All right. So you guys have seen solo before, right? Um, you did it pretty. I mean, you did solo neoclassical growth everything with Danny this year. I'm assuming same thing. Um, and so you're you're gonna be familiar with a lot of this. I mean, part of it is I just want to show you how things work um, in continuous time. Did you guys when you with Danny? Did you do much with uh, technology, like continual growth and technology, anything like that? Or were you more like kind of, you just have, you got capital, you got labor and see, see how things equilibrate. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, that's okay. It sounds like people agree or do not disagree. Uh, yeah. So you probably had Z or whatever going and you had some distribution, you know, Z prime conditional and Z, some kind of distribution going on there or something like that. Right. And that was just sort of moving around. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so and, yeah, so what we're going to do is, well, actually we're going to, we're not really going to have the stoch stochastic components. So that's a little easier. Um, uh, at least, you know, for, for a while, um, and then we're also going to have continual growth. Okay, so that's going to make things easier, right? Uh, without the stochastic part, but it, uh, once you introduce continual growth, you need to kind of worry about um, things not blow. Things are going to blow up in the sense that you're going to get exponential growth, but you want them to stay balanced. Okay, you want things to all kind of go and grow at the same same rate. You don't get this an imbalance where you have the capital labor ratio going haywire or anything like that. And to make sure that happens, basically, you need to kind of know what are the right assumptions. Okay, that, that's kind of the idea is that, that you can't, well, you can make any assumptions you want, uh, but a lot of them will lead you to weird outcomes, outcomes that are either just difficult to solve for, or just aren't, don't at all look like what, what we see in the data in the real world. Okay, so we're kind of, we're, we're jointly um, concerned about tractability basically of the model and also generating kind of like broad 
things that are broadly consistent with what we observe in the data. Okay, so the, the but the main things in the data in the modern kind of uh, post-industrial revolution, especially 20th century and beyond era is you have in and in, in the US, at least uh, in, in other sort of well, most countries at this point, uh, is you have exponential growth going on in, well, first of all, in population uh, and also in the standard of living, okay, in capital, things like that, like everything is kind of growing, okay, in in proportion, all right, so that that's what we want to preserve, okay. Now, there are changes because like you get structural changes going on, okay, so you have transition from uh, primarily agrarian economy to more manufacturing and more services and things like that. So things do change and they do change out of balance. Okay. But kind of once you hit a certain point, they, they, they get pretty stable. Okay. So, so that's why we want to do that. So, so the first, in a kind of the first approach, we're going to try and keep everything balanced. Okay. Uh, as we grow. Um, and, and in some sense, we're going to make it so simple that there aren't that many things that can be out of balance. Uh, and then as we go on, we'll, we'll loosen the assumptions up a little bit. Maybe we get some imbalance, at least in this, the short run. Okay. Um, and, and then just kind of explore in, in that, uh, neighborhood. Okay. So, um, yeah, but for now I kind of, I'll show you solo in continuous time. Okay. And, um, we'll probably, we'll go quicker than you would have gone the first time. Uh, so that we don't just rehash a bunch of stuff and I'll, I'll kind of show you just how, how does a basic continuous time model work right now it's going to be all exogenous um mechanical right um then we introduce when we introduce savings then that's when it becomes more akin to the neoclassical growth model um and that you know so that'll make that and that, that i'll actually call the ramsey model um and then uh that's going to make things a little bit more complicated and a little bit more interesting okay but for now we're just sort of in a mechanical solo world okay um alrighty so uh yeah and i guess in terms of the slides i mean i'll have i'll open these up uh the slides show you them here okay um it's just chapter two basically all right um and uh but I, i'll probably jump over to the the ipad in a minute okay but every most everything i do is gonna be on the slides there's probably even some stuff that i'll skip over that's that's also on the slides okay so uh there's an old Robert Solo. Actually, is he alive? He might not be alive. This is an old picture. I, I don't know. Um, he's certainly pretty old if he is alive. Okay, going on 100. I think I think he might have died recently. Arrow died. I know that, but I can't remember. So that's Bob Solo. Um, he kind of was instrumental, I think, in, in developing this, this model. Okay. Um, 1956. Okay. Uh, all right. And it's basically... Um, and, and the other thing I'm going to do is try and be pretty concrete about the assumptions that we're making. And, you know, different, sometimes you forget about assumptions that are implicit, okay? Uh, or sometimes people kind of gloss over them because they're so used to making them that they don't even think about it. Okay, I tried to think through all the different assumptions that are going on here, all right? So, uh, but basically, got ourselves a closed economy, all right? And a single, what's called the final good. Oh, we got a chat here. Uh, still alive, 97. What does that mean? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. I was like, is that a song lyric or something? Um, yeah, yeah. He, he's still, wow, okay, 97. All right, that's good. Okay, thank you for looking that up. Um, uh, okay, so, wait, so he's 24. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, all right, so Bob Solo is, uh, living, living long. All right. Um, I don't know what he's up to actually. He's he's long since emeritus, uh, but I, I assume. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe if, if you guys figure anything out, what what old Bob's up to, I'd be interested. Um, okay, so so yeah, but but back to his model. Uh, so we got a closed economy. So there's no trade. Okay, there's a single final good. Okay, uh, that um, what well, it actually doesn't really matter if anyone consumes it. We don't even have utility. Probably someone's going to consume it, but like we we don't really care about utility at this point because we're not doing any consumer optimization, all right. Um, and uh, yeah, so with Ramsey, you know, we will have utility that that'd be important. But but at this point, uh, pe people are working right because they're producing, uh, but but nothing is being said about their consumption per, per se. We just know how much is is being produced. Okay, um, an infinite time horizon. Okay, 
Uh, again, not in terms of utility, doesn't matter, but we're, we're, there's no stopping point, okay? Um, and uh, yeah, and then in terms of who's out there, okay, that, you know, for production, it kind of doesn't matter. I mean, there's a, a lot of agents, okay, and we're assuming, we're assuming that there's a continuum of agents because they're, they're, the number of agents is growing continuously, basically. So it's going to be growing at, eventually when, when we introduce growth, we'll be growing at a, a constant growth rate. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so, so, you know, in a static sense, maybe a discrete number of agents would be fine, but just because we need to assume a continual continuum uh, growth and a continuous process, we're going to have a, a continuum of agents. Okay. So, which is to say a real number greater than zero. Okay. So um, yeah. And they invest, they, uh, so they, yeah, so they produce stuff, I guess. Uh, and, and, and they invest some fraction S of that in new capital that you throw on top of the capital stock. All right. Uh, so that could be machines. Um, it could be, it, it's, I mean, it's something that is, is produced from final good. So, so like a product. So I, I don't know how to think about land. That's just kind of out there. Right. Uh, but, but machines and structures and things like that, I think is, is what we're thinking about here. Um, and, uh, yeah, distributional stuff, not specified. Basically, we're just talking about aggregates. Okay. The only reason I'm saying there's a large number of agents, um, is that, uh, you know, when we think about prices, like a wage or an interest rate, those, um, we're going to kind of derive those from a competitive set uh, from a competitive assumption that they're equal to their marginal products. So there, what I'm saying is to get that competition aspect, it, it's easiest to just assume that there's a lot of people out there and each of them has no market power. Okay. So that's, that's why I'm making, that's why I'm saying that that's an assumption that we're making, but we don't, we didn't care about prices. I mean, prices are just backed out from solo from the outcome. So if we didn't care about prices. We didn't, wouldn't have to make that assumption either. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, the next one. Uh, yeah. So then, and then in terms of production, it's pretty standard, you know, uh, you have final output Y, uh, I'll write of T for certain things, but for the most part, I won't. Okay. Uh, it's, it'll be implicit. Uh, but you know, Y of T is, you know, F the function, sum of function F of capital K land, uh, labor L and technology A. Okay. And all those are changing. Um, right. And then the way that capital is produced. Okay. And I think this is, this is kind of important is you just give up one unit of output and that produces one unit of capital. All right. And that's called, so that's called putty putty. And the reason it's called putty putty is that you, you can like in principle, you could have some output that you convert into capital today. And then tomorrow you actually want to like just deconvert it back into goods. Right. And, and so you can do that either way. So, uh, that's called putty putty because putty is like before you make, I don't actually know what I'm talking about here, but before you make clay, it's soft and you can mold it. Once you fire it into clay, then it is immutable, right? So uh, putty means that you, you turn it into capital, but it's still, you can mold it back into the consumption, okay? Sometimes people say putty clay, which is like you turn it into capital and that's it. If you, if you don't want it, then you just throw it out rather than, so disinvest it, I guess you would say, okay? Um, but the one for one thing is important because that's, well, that doesn't really make any sense. I mean, who, who just takes like, you know, some, you know, you can't just turn any random good into a car, right? I mean, you need to turn particular goods into cars. There's a whole production function there. Okay. So the production function is F of X equals X in this case, but that's a very specific assumption. Okay. Um, it is without loss of generality to assume that it's a uh, F of X equals X rather than like M times X or something like that, because we're not specifying units on anything here, right? Everything is just sort of like fantasy land units. Okay. Like how, you know, what is the unit on final output? It's not really clear. Okay. So because of that, we, the proportionality doesn't matter so much because I could get, get slumped into units, but um, the curvature say of that function would matter. And we're assuming that it's just linear. Okay. Um, there is going to be a, probably next week we'll have a homework problem where we where we change that assumption and make it a proper production function so we can see how that changes it doesn't radically change anything but you know, it may change some things here and there 
okay um and then uh for technology okay so that's uh you know in terms of production function it's it's clear it, it, it influences you know for a given set of inputs knl how much you produce okay that's technology um but uh if you want to think about like what what is sort of implicit in that i mean basically um it's like there's technology out there and, and for now it's just going to be coming out of nowhere okay or or just it's just sort of arises somehow um and that sort of everyone every firm out there can use it okay so it's just sort of like a publicly available thing it's on wikipedia or whatever okay um yeah so it's it's very simple in, the, in this case all right um okay so that's that's production all right uh you know we make the standard assumptions on on the production function decreasing uh sorry positive it's good you know more capital means more output more labor means more more output um and i'll, I'll say strictly like maybe you could get away with weekly probably but let's say strictly um and then decreasing returns to scale which is just that the you know you guys know what that means okay there's decreasing returns to scale in both capital and labor keeping the other one fixed so keeping labor fixed decreasing in capital keeping labor fixed it's decreasing in returns in in uh capital i might have said the same thing twice there but you get the idea um and then uh but f itself okay so in the individuals it's decreasing returns to scale right keeping one fixed and changing the other it's decreasing uh that's the second derivative but then f itself is is constant returns to scale in the sense that if you double both you double you double both capital and labor you double output okay um and that's uh did you guys talk about homogeneity as a property of functions and you did Okay, so yeah, so then, you know, uh, in that language, re constant returns to scale is homogeneity of degree one in, in K and L. Okay, so remember, you know, homogeneity, it's a property, you have, like, technically, you know, it's like you have the degree, but also it's like, over what arguments, right? Because we're not saying it A, right? You don't have to double A here, you just double K and L. Okay, A is, is kind of separate. All right, so then... Um, yeah, so homogeneity. Okay, so you guys already went over this, but you know, to, I'll just breeze through it. Okay, but basically, homogeneity in the general sense for some function g is just that if you multiply, and this is uh, an instance with two arguments, but you can imagine how it could apply to one or many arguments. Um, if you multiply <clears throat> both of those uh, input arguments by some factor lambda greater than zero, then that influences the final output, you know, proportional to lambda to the m. Okay, so when m is one, you get that standard constant returns to scale definition. We're not really going to do anything with m greater than one. Basically, m, m equals one is constant returns to scale. m equals zero is of some interest um, for the reason that is basically implied by this theorem here. Okay, so the Euler's theorem, one of hundreds probably, is this one is uh, saying you know uh, something about the uh derivative or i guess it's how the function relates to its partial derivatives okay and this would be useful um when we think about factor prices because those are our marginal products our partial derivatives okay mm. and so it says that um if g is to homogeneous degree one or of degree m then basically this uh formulation holds and so on the right side it's kind of like you're taking the partial derivatives and projecting them it's like um it's almost like a kind of a taylor expansion or something you know so you have the derivative times the value and 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 so you can express g or m times g as you know these this planar um function uh that the at least uh kind of a planar function these, these are obviously functions of x and y as, as the function of the partials okay um there's probably a better geometric like visual interpretation or, or exposition of that but I, I haven't thought about it too much um and then so so that's true and then also these partial derivatives here this is really the useful part uh also are the partial derivatives are homogeneous to degree m minus one right so the the case that we're going to be looking at where m equals one that means they're homogeneous to degree zero okay um yeah okay so um that would be useful, all right? And actually, uh, I don't know if you did this, but if, if you want to prove Euler's theorem, okay, uh, it's actually um, pretty simple, okay? You basically can take uh, 
the derivative of this. So this thing, this equation here, you know, is is by you know the the definition of, of homogeneity. That equation is true for all lambda. Okay, so you can uh, take the derivative of this with respect to lambda. Okay, so this this is let's see this this is true for all lambda. So so you can uh, take its derivative, and it's also going to be true. Both sides. Another way to think about it is like move it over to like this thing minus this thing equals zero. When you take the derivative, the right hand side is still zero and the left hand side is the derivative. Okay, and so you move it back. So the derivatives are equal. Okay, so um yeah, so I guess uh let me switch over to the not that, not that. This but the iPad. Okay, so if you if you want to think about just a quick quick proof of Euler's theorem because I think it's cool. All right, is, you know, our assumption on homogeneity is this. Okay, um, take a derivative with respect to lambda. Okay, and so on the left-hand side, you're gonna get two terms, one for x and one for y, from like a total derivative thing, plus a little bit of chain rule. So you got gx, Lambda x, lambda y, and that what pops out, you're taking the derivative with respect to lambda, so the x pops out, x plus g y, lambda x, lambda y, y, okay, on the left, and the right hand side is going to be m lambda to the m minus one, g of x y. So that's just standard. Yep, you're taking the derivative of lambda to the, some power, okay. Um, then evaluate that so that's true for all lambda still okay so we can evaluate that at lambda equals one which is where kind of where, like where we're starting so you know there you got g of x x these are just x and y now times x plus g y again pure x and y now here and then here you get m that lambda now is just one regardless of what m is okay uh even if it's zero and then m times g of x y okay and actually that's it all right so like, you know, genius Euler came up with this theorem that it takes two lines to prove, right? So I don't know. Coming up with the idea for the theorem is probably important too, but proving it, at least in this case, is not so hard. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's, that's Euler's theorem and, and we'll, we'll be using that for factor prices, okay? Um, and then the other thing, uh, actually, wait, so that was, well, that, okay, so that's the first part of Euler's theorem, okay? which is, let me just pop back here. Um, that's proving that relationship there, okay? Uh, the second part, which is saying that, you know, these these partial terms are homogeneous of a degree one step lower, okay? Um, you know, you can do the same thing. Okay, here, I, I just, I'll just leave it on the slides. You can do the same thing, but with, instead of taking a derivative with respect to lambda, you take a derivative with respect to either x or y, okay? So here I'm showing x and the, the same thing applies for y. So you start out with the definition of homogeneity, take it over with respect to x, so you get gx and that lambda that pops out instead of the x because we're taking the derivative with respect to x. And the right-hand side, the lambda is invariant and you get g sub x here. Again, uh, evaluate at lambda, sorry, let me think here. Oh no, you don't evaluate anything. Divide by lambda, you know, here, and that becomes an m minus one and you get that, okay? Um, and yeah, that's that's the definition of homogeneity degree m minus one. Okay, and then you can do the same thing for y. All right, so so and and uh, yeah, and so the then the the takeaway for for our purposes. Okay, and so the thing is here, like we're kind of using a bazooka here to uh, uh, the bazooka of thinking about homogeneity to just apply it to any the m equals one case in almost any instance. Okay. So bazooka being like a really powerful weapon. Um, so, you know, we're, 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 we're just overkill. Okay. But in the M equals one case, that means that the partials, so F, F K and F L for instance, uh, are going to be homogeneous degree zero. Okay. Which means if you look at this definition here, M equals zero, that just means they're invariant. If you scale up or down both, they're invariant. Okay. So in the, in the, concrete case of solo that means if you scale capital and labor up in proportion those marginal products don't change okay and that's that's true of 
uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's true of, of these constant returns to scale functions. Okay. Um, of any one, any of them. Okay. So, uh, it just com comes out invariably. Okay. And we'll, we'll usually be using Cobb Douglas and it's, it's also true there because Cobb Douglas is constant returns. Okay. Um, all right. So let's keep moving. All right. So that's sort of just the, the little bit of math that we need to, to think about this stuff. Okay. Um, like I said, markets are competitive for the purposes of, of getting factor prices, the wage and the interest rate. Okay. Um, labor market is very simple and boring. Okay. There's just a set of people and they just work. Okay. Maybe they work. Uh, it's, it's without lots of generality to say that they work all the time or that they work a fixed amount of time per day or some average amount of time. It doesn't really matter again, cause we're just dealing in aggregates here. Um, and so, yeah. And then there's, there's some wage that's, uh, the marginal product. Okay. I guess, um, yeah, so yeah, their, their labor supply is inelastic though. Okay. Um, all right. And then, uh, we'll be looking at cases later on where, the, where they're making labor choices, but not for now. Um, and capital. So capital is, is, is always a little tricky, at least for, for me, um, how, how the market for capital works. Okay. Um, because there's a couple, I think there's like multiple different ways you could think about it actually working in the real world. All right. But one way is to say that the agents uh, in this model own the capital stock. All right. And then they rent it to firms. Okay. Firms use it for production. In the process of using it for production, it also depreciates a little bit, breaks down. Okay. Uh, and then they give it back or they, they say, okay, you know, they use it for one period or one instant in this case and produce and that's it. Okay. So, and then the next instant, something else happens. Okay. Um, and so, yeah. So, and so there's some initial condition K zero, right? So, uh, you just, you just need to specify some initial condition. Um, and then the, yeah, so the firms rent it and then we're going to call the rental rate, the rental price, I guess, uh, capital R. All right. There's two R's there's capital R and lowercase R, unfortunately. So the, the rental price itself, that's going to be the marginal product. Okay. Uh, that's going to, um, yeah, that's going to be R, all right. It depreciates at rate Delta. Okay. So then if you're an agent thinking about like, what's your financial return, uh, to renting this out. Okay. So you get the rental price, uh, but then, um, your cap, the capital that you rented out depreciates by a factor Delta. Okay. So, and that's financial sense. You've lost it. it it's like you lost a fraction Delta of your capital. Okay. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't really matter if it's like you had a certain number of machines and the fraction Delta broke down versus all of your machines broke down by some fraction Delta. Okay. It's all the kind of, you just look at the total effective amount of capital. All right. So, but, but sometimes that matters. Okay. The nature of depreciation. Okay. So the, the usual sort of like everything degrades by a factor of Delta is one way to go. But, but the other way to go is saying that like, you know, a machine works perfectly until stochastically it just breaks down or blows up one day. Okay. Um, the second case is called one Haas shade depreciation, uh, which is, which is about a carriage, like a horse carriage breaking down. It's, it, it's based on some poem by Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, about a, a, a carriage that works perfectly until one day it explodes. It's kind of a whimsical little thing. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, but, but for our purposes, it actually doesn't matter. All right. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's pretty much it. The other, okay. And so the, the reason I said that you can have different interpretations is the other way to think about it maybe is that, um, uh, there's an intermediary, okay. A financial intermediary. So for instance, a, a bank, right. May own this physical capital. All right. And here, here's when you, when you start having financial intermediaries then you need to think about financial versus physical capital. Okay. So, um, but if, in this case, if a bank owned the capital, uh, and, um, rented it out to firms and then sort of consumers invested in that via the bank, because the consumers give money to the bank, um, and say, I'm, you know, I'm going to invest, I'm going to sort of have an ownership stake in this, this capital or, or get the return from this capital. All right. So they, they give money to the bank, the bank buys capital, rents it out to firms gets the return from that and gives it back to the consumer. Okay. So you can think about it like that, but it's just like such a simple model. It doesn't really matter 
at the end of the day, you know, it all goes back to the same place. Okay. And it all, it, and at the end of the day, really what matters is what gets produced, which is the amount of physical capital. Okay. So in this case, um, the, the distinction between a phys the actual physical capital and the, the financial capital that sort of represents that is, is not that important. Okay. All right. So, so that's capital. Um, and then the, the final goods, like, if you want to think about it like this, uh, the price of a final good is normalized to be one in all periods. Um, that's only really important if you want to map into GDP, right? We could just talk about output and some abstract notion of units. If you want to think about GDP, that's usually price times output. Okay. Um, so in that case, uh, you know, you need to say something about prices. And so we just say the simplest thing is that they're all one. Okay. Um, and, and when you assume prices are one in each period, basically you're, you're kind of implicitly assuming any differences show up in the interest rate. Okay, so the interest rate represents the evolution, any evolution of prices over time. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, okay, so the the firms, right? The, so they're they're renting capital, right? Um, and and hiring labor. Okay, hiring people to do labor. Um, and so their optimization problem is probably you know it's one you've seen before. They are choosing capital and labor to produce some amount of output according to this production function. And they're paying each laborer W and each for each unit of capital, they pay R, capital R, that rental rate. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, so, and, and, and essentially, you know, the, uh, let's see. So, so yeah, that, that, that's, you know, for any given W and R, we know you just take a derivative of this, that you get out these marginal conditions that, you know, take derivative with respect to L, FL here is going to be equal to W. I think with respect to K, FK, so K here is going to be, uh, FK here is going to be equal to R. Okay. So these just come out from the optimality of the firm. Okay. Um, and then, you know, uh, if you want, to, so you can think about this as a market clearing thing. Okay. So if you want to uh, think about a market that is clearing, so there's a certain amount of labor out there and people just work exogenously, they, or they kind of, offer to work exogenously. If you want firms to hire that exact amount, okay, you just plug in that number for L here and whatever capital and that's that's your wage. Okay, so these are like market clearing, but it's like such a simple market because supply is fixed. Okay, and the demand is all just what the firms do. And so these prices clear that market, right? Um, <clears throat> but it's really just a way to get prices from, from quantities, right? Okay, so... Uh, Moving on. All right. So um, this is where we can use homogeneity. Okay. So if you want to think about uh, uh, the profits of the firms. Okay. So if, if you just think, apply the definition of homogeneity of degree one, constant returns to scale to F. Okay. So Y, y is equal to F K L A. All right. Um, so so on, the, on the left hand side, you have, you know, Y equals F K L A. And on the right, you have you know, these, this W is F sub L, this R is F sub K. So by that, that equation from Euler's theorem, it's just this exact equation here. This, this, you know, this is F, this is FL, this is FK. Applying that definition gives you exactly this equation. All right. Um, and this means, you know, the revenues of the firm minus all these costs is equal to zero. So their profit is equal to zero. Okay. Um, again, just comes from constant returns to scale. Um, Inada conditions, you've seen, you've seen Inada before, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're going to assume that to sort of standard properties of, of the production function. Um, okay. All right. So, so that's, that's pretty much it in terms of the assumptions. Okay. So, uh, yeah. All right. So, so now we can actually go through and, and kind of solve the model. Okay. So what I'm going to do is um, I'll try and give you an idea of, of where things depart from the, the discrete time world. Okay. So, uh, so I guess we're actually properly starting solo here. All right. So then, you know, in the, in the, just, you know, so the, the first equation up here is, is a law of motion for capital K dot. All right. So, but if, you know, um, if we want to start from the discrete time world, 
Okay, and then we'll, let's move to the continuous time world. Okay, so in the discrete time world, you probably had something like this. Kt plus 1 is equal to 1 minus delta times Kt plus some investment term, right? So this, this is what you would write in discrete time world is that capital of the next period is your last period's capital depreciated by a factor of delta plus whatever new investment you have, okay? Um, you know, another way to think about it is that the change in capital, kt plus one minus kt, is equal to, you know, some loss from depreciation and that's just i, i t, uh, some gain from investment, okay? Um, all right, so that, that's a discrete time sort of statement, all right? Uh, so, so let's discrete, I think it's spelled like that, discrete, my handwriting is bad, and then continuous time over here, okay? Um, so in continuous time, all right, so what, what I'm going to do is, uh, instead of having kt plus 1, kt and everything like that, I'll have like k of t and everything, right? So, and also I'm going to start out in a world where we we kind of step through time through uh, at steps delta. So we, we're at time t, then t plus delta, then t plus two delta, and so on and so on. Okay, and then we're eventually going to take delta to zero. That'll be continuous time, but we need to first start in sort of this approximate discrete time. Okay, so in that case, we can write you know think about the evolution of k. So k of t plus delta in the ne next time step. All right, so it's going to be, uh, so first of all, the, the kind of the way things kind of just work out is instead of having 1 minus delta, we're actually going to have, and this is confusing terminology, but we're going to have 1 minus capital delta times little delta. Okay, so little delta is, well, actually, so the other thing to say is here, delta, you know, weak, strong, I don't know, is somewhere between zero and one. Whereas here, that little delta is simply a positive number. It can be greater than one, okay? Because it's a continuous rate, all right? Continuous rates are just positive numbers. Uh, sort of, it's it's like um, in probability, you know, probability in discrete time is a number between zero and one. Uh, a flow probability in continuous time is just a positive number, okay? So we'll see that later with the continuous Poisson processes, okay? But for now, this depreciation is actually just a positive number. Okay, and then, uh, so so the idea here is, and and I'll, you know, so this will be attached to a KT, all right? So the idea here is there's a depreciation rate delta, okay? But in continuous time, you need to know how long you're depreciating for, right? So if, if you, if you, if, if you have a second elapses, you depreciate a certain amount. If a year elapses, you depreciate probably a lot more, okay? Um, and so you can't just use delta, right? You need to use delta times the amount of times that has passed, okay? All right. And so, uh, yeah, and, and it, as it happens, okay, it's going to be exactly linearly proportional to time. So, I mean, in some world, it may be true that depreciation is like nonlinear in time, but the simplest explanation is to say like the amount of depreciation is linear, exactly proportional to the amount of time that has elapsed. Okay, um, and and that assumption of exact proportionality will give you exponential decay, right? So that that's equivalent to having exponential decay. Well, we can show that too. All right. So, um, okay. So, but 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 this is what we're gonna have for now. Okay. So you have some, but but essentially that delta, you know, del I'll call it delta delta, which sounds silly, but it's capital delta times little delta. That delta delta term is analogous to the old discrete time delta because we're in approximate discrete time, okay? So that's depreciation, and then we're also gonna have delta times i of t, okay? And so again, we have to, we have i, which is a rate of investment. So it's like capital per second. How much capital per second are you are you producing? To turn that into an actual quantity of the amount of, to, to add into capital, we need to multiply it by something with time units. So delta, in this case, in seconds. So it's delta times i, okay? so. That's one thing we work in continuous time is knowing uh, how to work in this sort of de delta time step world and then take a limit. So when we derive stuff the first time, we'll we'll start out with the delta time step world and take the the limit as delta goes zero. 
once we do that, we don't have to do that every single time we do something. We can just work in continuous time in, uh, directly, but but it's good to get an idea of where things come from. All right. Okay. So so this is our statement in sort of what I'll call a you know, pro, uh, approximate continuous time. All right. Uh, we can rearrange this. Okay. So let's first, you know, you can again look at the difference. Okay. You'll end up with something like this. Okay, so we just um, subtracted KT. You can see on the right-hand side, there's a factor of delta on both of those. Okay, so let's divide that through here. Okay, so we're gonna divide over the other side. So then we, here we get minus delta KT plus I of T. Okay, so this is good. Okay, because on the left, we have something that looks a lot like a derivative, at least before you take the limit. Right, uh, and on the right we have something that actually doesn't depend on delta at all. Okay, so let's take the limit. So let's take the limit as capital delta. That time step goes to zero. So on the left hand side we're going to get oops, um, k dot of t. All right, and on the right hand side we're going to have minus delta k of t plus i of t. Okay, that's it. All right, so that's, you know, we started the approximate continuous time and then now we've taken the limit to proper continuous time and we're left with this equation, okay? And it just says, you know, the, the rate of change of capital is the rate of depreciation, which is proportional. So it's multiplied by K, all right? And then uh, investment, okay? And this exact, this equation is what we have on the, on the slides here, yep, there, you know, that's that inverted, but K dot is I minus delta K. All right, so that's that's you know in you know in the future we can just start there. We don't have to do this whole delta shenanigan stuff, but that's where you would get it from if you want to think about things as as coming from discrete time. Okay. All right, so um, yeah, I guess uh, yeah, and so you know that thing I was mentioning about um, exponential processes and and proportional depreciation. So you can see that here. So imagine, imagine we were in a world with no investment. Okay, so that uh, you know i is zero. So this would just be k dot is minus delta k. So this is a world where we just, we did stop doing investment, we're just letting everything go to hell. Uh, but it's still depreciating. So it's like post-apocalyptic. You know, there's trees growing out of buildings and water. You know, flooding New York City, all of that. Okay, so uh, what is that going to look like? All right. Um, well, it's, it, I mean, th this is going to be our law of motion for K. All right. So in general, with this solo, even even a simple model like solo, we don't really have we we have differential equations that that govern the the dynamics, but we can't really solve them explicitly. Okay. Now this equation we can actually solve it explicitly because it's incredibly simple. All right. So uh, yeah, I mean, one way to do it. Um, there, there's two ways to do this. There's uh, dividing and using what we know about logarithms. Okay. Um, that's one way. Uh, the other way is what I call the, the Echimoglu cheating method. Uh, but actually I'm not going to do that. I'm, which involves like multiplying like a DT to the other side, even though you're not supposed to do that. Okay. But I'm not going to do that because it's confusing. All right. So I'm just going to do the way that I normally do. So let's write it like this. So basically on the left, we have the growth rate of K. Right, k dot over k, and on the right we're just gonna have delta. Okay, so that's just dividing. All right. Um, okay, and then we can see um, I'm gonna move right here uh, that you know k dot over k, as we talked about with growth rates, that's the derivative of the log. Okay, so that's ddt of the log of k. I'll write of t. Okay, so K, uh, ah. K of T. There we go. D of T of the log of K of T. And that's equal to minus delta. All right. Then uh, we can integrate this. All right. Um, so let's see. When we, when we integrate it, okay, on the left-hand side, we're going to get log of 
KFT. All right. Uh, and then, well, we're going we're gonna to have a constant in proportionality. All right, plus C. Okay, and that's going to be equal to minus delta. The right-hand side, when we integrate it, we're just going to get T. Okay, so, um, yeah, or maybe I'll, I'll put the, the constant on the other side. So this plus C. It doesn't matter because each side gets a constant. We can just combine them. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so log of K of T is equal to minus delta T plus some C. All right, and then if you uh, exponentiate that, you're going to get K of T is equal to e to the minus delta t times e to the c cap well, capital or in case it's not clear all right so that you just exponentiate that constant so now what what is the constant well it, it's just whatever um satisfies your initial condition okay which we didn't specify but k zero okay so so essentially it just it has to look like this k of t is k of zero times e to the minus delta t. Okay, so that that trivially satisfies our initial condition when you evaluate that at t equals zero, k zero equals k zero, and then it decays exponentially from then on. Okay, so you know this this constant uh, negative in proportional depreciation essentially just it's a negative growth rate in in the terms that we talked about. And anytime you have a, a constant growth rate, you get ex, a exponential function that satisfies that, and that's what you see here. Okay, so that's that's what happened. Now you have in the in the, the, the full total model you have investment counteracting that, and it might be time varying. So it you know that's going to be more complicated. Uh, but in the really simple, just like decaying world, you know that's that's what you get. All right. Um, okay, so then uh, let's see. So now now okay, that was a little bit of an aside there. Okay, about how to sort of derive solo law of motion okay but at the end of the day what's important is this okay and i'm going to drop the the i uh sorry the t subscripts okay so that at the end of the day this is our law of motion for capital okay k dot equals i minus delta k uh yeah and then the if you want to think about how to concisely write the assumptions of the model i mean usually it's just you know you need to know what's the law of motion for capital we have that uh what's output okay so output is just going to be a well okay well output is equal to f of kla equal to y and also output is split between consumption and investment okay um and then the the solo assumption is that investment is some fraction s of output okay so this is like an over i mean we're going to be able to simplify this down into one equation but if you want to think about it as like three different things it's like law of motion for capital as far further than i can point um production like what what happens with production and how does it get split between consumption really what happens with production and then how does production get split between investment and consumption okay so those, those are kind of sort of redundant but but that's what we have okay and so you know we because they're kind of redundant we can just simplify them into like a one single law of motion for capital all right uh so that's going to be you know so k dot is equal to i which is s times y minus delta k all right and then we can even you know plug in for f and say this is s times f of K L, oops, K L A minus delta K. All right. So this is, you know, here is just given that L and A for now are constants. This is just a, a law of motion for capital purely in terms of capital and various parameters and constants. Okay. So yeah, that's 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 the solo model in one equation. All right. Um, yeah. And then, uh, so, so we can solve that. Okay. We could solve it in aggregate. Okay. Usually we're going to be looking at things in, in normalized terms. All right. So this is the aggregate law of motion for capital. Almost always we're going to want to normalize either because in, in this case, there's no point, but, but we might want to think about things in per capita terms because like, that's just, more cl this closer to what we care about we don't really care about the 
total size of the economy. We care about the standard of living per capita stuff. Okay, so we may want to reformulate this in per capita terms. Um, uh, but especially once we have growing population and growing technology, all right, we're going to want to normalize those. We're going to have to normalize them in order to, to find concrete solutions. Okay, so so let's do that in, in the simple case, and then we'll start adding in stuff that's moving around over time. Okay. Um, all right, so let's see, how should we do this? Uh, yeah, okay, so so let's think about normalized terms. I'll start a new page for this. Normalized. Okay, uh, right, so, so what we're gonna do is say, okay, well, let's define little y is capital Y over L, little k is capital K over L. All right, so y I think is clear. Uh, with 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 little lowercase k, I should say little k uh, and capital K. Obviously, they look pretty similar, but the the rule here is if the the lines on the k cross, that's lowercase. If they're not crossing mostly, then that's capital. So most of the time, we're going to be doing things per capita, so we don't have to worry too much. But it is can be confusing, All right? So and I'll try to stick to that. Um, okay, so we're going to normalize these things by population, which isn't growing now, but it will be in the future. Okay. Um, and what do we get? So, so then first we define our normalizing terms. Okay. In this case, it's a simple ratio of, of the thing to population, but in the future it might be normalized by technology term as well. And so it could be more complicated, but in this case, it's just that, uh, and then we reformulate our model in those normalized terms. Okay. So, so think about little y, okay. It's y over L, which is F of K. L A over L. All right, just by the definition of capital Y. Now, um, so here, uh, you know, usually it's cheating to divide through a functional barrier, of, like into the parentheses. But in this case, when we have constant returns to scale, it's not cheating. We're allowed to do that because if we divide, um, Let's see, dividing, if you take total output and divide it by a certain factor, that's the same as dividing the inputs by a certain factor. And so it looks a lot like you're distributing kind of into the function. All right, so so this is going to be equal to uh, f of k over l comma 1 comma a. So it's, it's, it's homogeneous to degree 1 in k and l, right? So those are the relevant things that we're divi like dividing into. And it's almost like we're distributing into that function, okay? This is this is this relies on the um, specifically homogeneity degree one concentration scale, basically distributing this L into this function. Another way to think about it is uh, that our lambda, this is equivalent to thinking about in terms of homogeneity, your lambda is one over L. Okay, so here it says one over L lambda times F is equal to F of k k times lambda, which is k over L, and L times lambda, which is one. Okay, so this is applying that definition of homogeneity at one over L. Okay. But you know, if, if you want to think about it intuitively, it is really like just distributing in. Okay. Which is normally cheating, but we're, we're allowed to cheat in this case, only in this case, otherwise no cheating. All right. So, um, yeah, so that's what we get. And then the, the, the next thing we do is we just define this to be little F of little K. All right. Which, um, or, or there's really two steps. Okay. So first of all, sorry, first of all, this just by the definition of little K is capital F little K one a. All right. And then we're defining that function to be F of K. So the function where you take your original aggregate production function, have exactly one unit of labor, and then vary the amount of capital that you're inputting. That's the definition of little F. And it only works because we have constant returns to scale, but that's that's the definition. Okay. Uh, and then a well a is fixed anyway, so we we kind of just drop it when we when we write little f. Later on, if a is moving around, we may need to worry about that. But uh, for now, we can just have, have little f. Okay. So so little f is your like per capita production function in the sense that it tells you, given amount of capital per worker, here's how much output per worker you get. Okay. And this this um this relies on and kind of even exemplifies the the concept of, of constant returns to scale, right? Because what it says is that the output per worker 
only, the only thing that matters is the amount of capital per worker. So if, if, um, and, and it's, it's so, so what, what it's really saying is that you have a bunch of different production units. Okay. Like you have a bunch of different factories and they don't interact at all. Right. So if you double the amount of capital, so you make twice as many factories and you double the amount of workers, which is to say you staff those factories in the exact same proportion of workers per factory, you will double output, which makes sense. If the factories are not interacting at all, they're not competing for scarce resources. They're not collaborating. They're just separate. That's constant returns to scale. And that's what, that's what you see here. So the only thing that matters is how many people do you have in, per factory in, when you're thinking about the, the product of that, the, the amount of, so the, the output per worker in that factory. Okay. So it does matter if your factory is too crowded or not staffed well enough. That's important, but but how many factories you have doesn't matter. Okay, that's a way to think about uh, constant returns, and that's also something that that kind of showed up in Malthus, right? Because in Malthus we were we were thinking a lot about how does the output per person depend on the amount of land per person. Okay, land here is capital, or capital here is land. It's the same idea. Okay, so at the end of the day, the important thing though is we get this very simple equation, which is that little y is is a uh, little f, little k, of little k. All right, so that's number one. All right, I guess that's important. There's a box around it. That means it's important. Okay. Um, and then number two is the law of motion for capital. All right. Um, I guess I guess if we're thinking about uh, yeah. So so let's think about the law of motion for capital. All right. So um, remember that originally was K dot is uh, S F K L A minus Delta K. That's our original law of motion for capital. All right. Um, and so if we want to think about little K, all right. So, so there's, uh, so we know the law of motion for capital K. Now we want to figure out what's the law of motion for, for normalized K, K capital per worker. All right. So in that case, um, there's many ways to do this. Okay. The best way I, the way I always uh, suggest is we want to find the law of motion for little K. So the best way to do that in my world is think about the growth rate of little K. Oops. So, so th just figure out what the growth rate of your normalized variable is. So this is capital. This is little K, right? Well, yeah. So, and remember little K is K over, capital K over L. Okay, so the growth rate of little k, our, our rules for growth rates, right, should be the difference between the growth rate of, as a quotient, it should be the difference between the growth rate of capital and the growth rate of labor. Okay, that's true in general. Basically, that's just the definition. That's the quotient rule, all right? In this first setting, the growth rate of labor is zero because labor is not changing over time, all right? So then uh, it's going to be just the growth rate of capital. Okay. Um, now that doesn't mean that the derivatives are the same. Okay. So there's going to be a slight difference, but they're going to be related. Okay. And then if we think about um, uh, how that kind of factors through. Okay. So, uh, well, first of all, you know, subbing in for K dot. S F of K L A minus delta K. I'm being, I'm gonna take this you know one step at a time here. Sub in for K dot. All right. Divide through. Okay, so again here, um okay, well no, sorry. Here the we could do one that's tempting to do one thing, but I want you to resist the temptation to do that, which is dividing through by K. We could if we wanted to. Okay, we could divide through by K on that first term and get F of one L over K and A. But it turns out that we don't want to do that because then we'd have to define some other F little F prime or hat or something, which is one, one over K, which is just not a thing that we're interested in. Okay. So we're going to resist the temptation to do that. Instead, we're going to divide the top and the bottom by K. All right. The second term, the Delta K that just cancels. That's just minus Delta. We know that I'm concerned with the first term. We're going to divide the top and the bottom by L because then on the top, we get that thing that we saw before, 
from here. When we divide that F by L, we get the same thing, little k, basically. Um, and then, and, and, I mean, really, another way to think about this is, is actually just think in terms of Y. Maybe that's even easier. That thing is, is it's just Y, okay? So if we divide the top and the bottom by L, we get little y on top and little k on the bottom. Okay, so let, let's just do that. So we have S, Y over K minus delta. Okay, and then so that, that now we're actually doing the division. I'm gonna move over here. All right, so we divide the top and the bottom by L, so you get S, Y over L, K over L minus delta, and that's just s little y over little k minus delta, right? And this is little k dot over k, all right? So we're almost there. So now we have, you know, some, the thing on the left, k dot over k, little k dot over little k is all normalized. The thing on the right is all normalized. We can even, you know, move that little k over and just get k dot, pure k dot. That's going to be s y minus Delta K, that's all normalized. And if you really want, you can write S F of K minus Delta K. All right, so, so that's just, you know, for completeness. So this is S F of K minus Delta K. That's our, our other equation there. All right, so um, that's all normalized, right? Everything there is lowercase. That's what we wanted. So now we have the production function equation in, uh, squared off up top. And then this one over here, this, this basically all we need. I mean, we only, really all we need is this equation on the right. That's purely in terms of a little k. All right, so now we've eliminated dependence on, on labor. So now the thing is, if you look at where we started, we, we started here and then we got here. And all, I mean, start to finish, all that happened was everything became lowercase except for S and Delta, which already were lowercase. So it may have seemed like that was a lot of work to just divide the whole thing by L, which is true. It was kind of a waste of time, but not entirely because we're, when we do the same thing in the future, it's going to turn out slightly differently because for instance, this thing isn't going to be zero. Okay. Because this was zero, it turned out to be just, you know, why didn't you just divide by L in the first place from here directly? Uh, but when this is non-zero, then you get a factor of, you know, say, Usually we're going to call it N, the growth rate of population. You got an N you're carrying around. It'll sort of get paired off with that delta and turn into like an effective depreciation rate. So you can't do, you can't just divide by L except in this case. In the future, that would cause a problem. Like um, we have to go through these steps to get it right in the future. Okay. All right. So um, cool. All right. So so that's, that's basically, I mean, the, the most important thing right there is that we got a little K dot. All right, that, that's our reformulated normalized model. Okay, um, so we can think about that just on its own. Um, so, okay, so the one thing is factor prices are annoying and I'm not gonna drive them today because it's the last time it's a lecture and you never wanna do anything difficult the last time it's a lecture, mostly because I'll screw it up, but also because you guys are probably getting somewhat fatigued. Okay, so, so we'll talk about factor prices next time, but basically you can write factor prices as functions of capital K and capital L. And by utilizing kind of constant return stuff, we can also express them purely as uh, functions of little K. Okay. Because like basically your marginal product only depends on like the amount of capital per worker, stuff like that. So we'll do that next time. Um, <clears throat> and then I'm kind of cycling through the notes here, but basically we'll show existence. Uh, no, we won't show, well, we'll, we'll argue for existence. Okay. It's a pretty simple model, so it's not it's not a big problem. Okay, and then some some notion of stability. Okay, but basically, if you want to think about um, if you want to think about steady state here, okay, so I have more room. Um, if you want to think about steady state, okay, so when we say um, just a, a note on terminology here, when I say steady state, that means in a in a non growing model, that means literally things just converge to specific values. In a growing model, like where, where everything is growing, but in proportion, that means things, the proportion of things converges to some value. So even though population and output are growing, the amount of output per worker converges to a value of some sort. Um, 
that's what I mean by steady state. Okay. Uh, the notion of equilibrium is a little different. Like you can have an equilibrium, which comprises a path of outcomes where everyone is optimizing or something like that. But then the steady state is late, you know, is a, is a more specific thing, which is when things are actually not moving around over time. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So then steady state in this world, things aren't moving around over time. That means that, you know, little k dot is equal to zero. Okay. Which implies S of F of K is equal to Delta K. So the force of investment S F of K is exactly equal and counteracts the force of depreciation. Therefore capital per worker is not moving around over time. Okay. So that's, that's what is steady. And so I guess you could say that there, the K that satisfies that K star is our steady state. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's just algebraically. All right. Uh, you know, you could also think about it graphically. Okay. And I think this is more useful. Okay. So think about a graph here where we're plotting K dot as a function of K. All right. So this is like uh, the state space basically is just K. And so we want to know, given where we are in the state space of value for K, where we're going to go. All right. You probably, you might've done graphs where you had KT versus KT plus one. Okay, we can't really do that here in continuous time, but we can do k current versus the rate of change of k. All right, and so so this is uh, zero. This but for both x and y, this is a zero point. Okay, uh, you think about that equation up there. Um, the uh, yeah, so at zero, you produce zero output and you have no depreciation because you just got nothing. All right, so that k dot is going to be zero, and that if you are exactly at zero, you're kind of stuck there, you know, um, increase stuff. Okay. In the initial point, we have, a, a an F of K, which, which we, we built in those anatomic conditions and those apply to a little left too. So basically the, 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 uh, the marginal product at zero is going to be infinite. So that, that F function is going to go up like a square root kind of thing. All right. Versus a linear term, which just, it's just linear. Okay. So we know, oops, because of these anata, oh dear conditions uh that sorry about that this is son of a, the iPad is not cooperating uh this is going to go up for a time okay and uh now the thing is that you have f basically is going to have decreasing returns okay as you add more and more capital per worker the the uh the f prime the marginal product of that additional capital is going to go down Okay, and and it's going to go down to zero, in in our assumptions here. That's like the other end of the anatomic condition, uh, and eventually, once that gets really small, then you have a linear term, which it doesn't, it just goes, you know, it doesn't stop. All right, so eventually, it's going to turn around and go back below zero. Okay, so so you got a decreasing return. You got a ton of capital. The additional capital isn't doing that much because you everyone already has machines to work on but it's depreciating like crazy because it's proportional depreciation. And so that's why it goes negative. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. So this is, this is our space here. And uh, this is kind of analogous to those Malthusian graphs we were doing, except it's more direct. It's because with Malthus, it was like, you have standard of living, which maps into the population growth rate, which then maps back into movements in the standard of living here. It's just capital. Where is it? Where is it going? All right. So uh, steady state is is the intersection with zero, right? That's where k dot equals zero. That's our steady state. Um, uh, you can see there's two here, k equals zero and some positive k, which is sort of the non-trivial solution to this equation here. Because zero works here, but also there's a positive uh, non-trivial solution. Okay, so if, usually if I just say k star, it's the positive one. I'm kind of going to preclude zero in general, just because it's kind of boring, like, right? So, uh, but the other thing about zero is that it's not stable, right? If you if you know, if if you start here, okay, k dot's positive, you're going to move up. So anywhere positive and to the left of the 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 good k star, you're going to move up this line, and eventually you're going to hit k star. And if you're there, you're you're not going to go anywhere. If you're nearby, you're going to go towards it, and then here, if you're below it. Oh dear. If you're below it, well, you're you're gonna your k 
dot is negative, okay, so you're going to move left and you're going to move towards that. So the, you know, this this thing here, this steady state here, K star, I call it, is stable. Either side, you're just going to converge toward it. The zero steady state is unstable. So that's another reason to kind of ignore it. All right, if you had any amount of capital, you could bootstrap your way up to, to K star eventually. All right. Um, okay, so that's a really simple you know, example of a, a state space diagram, or sometimes I'll call it like a phase space diagram. They're kind of the same thing. All right. Uh, because it, it only has two steady states and only one of them is stable. And that's, that's it. Okay. So um, now the other thing just to, to build some intuition for working with these is that the essentially what determines the stability of a steady state is the direction that you cross the zero point in. So on the left-hand side, well, we don't really cross it. We just kind of emanate it from a bit. We, in some sense, we're crossing out from the bottom to the top, okay? And that ended up being unstable because if we're on the right-hand side, it's the the rate of change is positive, so we're going away from it. Away from it. If we were on the left-hand side, somehow a negative, the rate of change would be negative. We're going away from it, okay? Whereas on the other one, when we cross it downwards, you know, if we're on the left-hand side, the derivative is positive, pushing us back. And vice versa. Okay, so so just graphically, the you you know it's always going to be that if you have a continuous law of motion, the ones crossing downwards are going to be stable, and the ones crossing upwards are going to be unstable. Okay, so let me just <clears throat> this is just for this is just a generic you know I don't know where this would come from, but sort of a Loch Ness monster kind of thing here. All right, so if this was our law of motion for some real goofy model that we had, well then these would be the steady states okay and the ones crossing downwards would be stable uh, i'll mark those in stars okay and the ones crossing upwards would be unstable okay so the downwards ones if you're below it your k dot is positive and that's going to push you towards it and vice versa okay so the the, the laws of motion are going to look like this i'm just you know if it's above the line it's it's moving right? If it's below the line, it's moving left. Okay. And so that's going to determine <clears throat> what's stable and what's not. Okay. So what did I just do? I messed up some of these, probably these ones. Okay. So these are moving away, away. And then these are also wrong. That's not what I wanted. Okay. All right, so this is what it should look like. Okay, so the ones crossing downwards, the arrows are pointing towards them. The ones crossing upwards, the arrows are pointing away from them. That's just the saying if, if the line is above the axis, it's moving right and vice versa. Okay, so so these are, I guess I'll circle these. So these are our stable ones. The other thing you can see is that if, you know, if it's continuous uh, law of motion, right, then it must be that if you cross downwards one time, you must cross upwards the next time, right? Which means that this, the if you have multiple steady states, the stable ones are going to like alternate. Okay. I don't know if there's any deep meaning to that, but that's just how it works out. Okay. So in this case, if this were your law of motion, you'd have two stable steady states and three unstable ones. And that's just the, the way things would work. And if you wanted to think about where, you know, another way to think about it is uh, where will you end up conditional on initial condition? Well, the, in this case, the world or the state space is partitioned in the two regions that are actually centered or divided by this unstable steady state here, right? If you're to the left of that one in the middle where the dotted line is, you're going to end up at, you know, steady state A, I'll call it. If you're to the right, you're going to end up at steady state B. Okay, I guess you could also say, really, the unstable steady states demarcate the initial condition zone. So in the middle, um, let me make sure I get this right. Yeah, so, so it, it, and the, the, between the two left-hand dotted lines, you end up in steady state A. Between the two right-hand dotted lines, you in steady state B. If you're on the other sides, you kind of diverge to infinity. Okay, that doesn't have to be the case, but it is in, in this in this world. Um, yeah, so that that's what you get. All right. Um, so so but but so we're we're going to apply this graphical analysis tools to the general models. Okay, and it, and it can be useful because you can actually just. Um, even in situations where you can't analytically solve things, uh, you can get an idea of the dynamics and like what's stable, what's unstable, where you're going to end up as a function of your initial condition. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm out of time. 
so, uh, yeah, uh, I guess I'll see you next time. And, um, I don't know, I have Bob Sowers tomorrow at 2. Okay, so you want to stop by there. I'll be there here, same same Zoom address, Zoom ID. Okay, and then otherwise I'll see you in class next time. And then also just remember, I'm going to push the <clears throat> uh, due date and time for the homework to recitation on Friday. Okay, thanks.